Okay, uh, let's begin. Today is our third and concluding lecture about modern religions and the afterlife in modern religions. Today we are going to talk about the Baha'i faith. Baha'i faith is an independent um, religious movement that was born in Iran in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, on the slide you see uh, the main temple uh, of the Baha'is uh, in the United States or in America. Uh, it is located in Wilmot, Illinois, near uh, the city of Chicago. All of Baha'i temples are constructed in a similar way. All of them have nine doors welcoming uh, the people from all religions. Nine doors symbolize the nine prophets that Baha'is recognize as the true prophets of God, starting with Abraham, then Moses, then Zoroaster, the founder of Zoroastrianism, then the Buddha, the founder of Buddhism, Krishna, um, the founder of one of the uh, branches of Hinduism, Jesus, Muhammad, and the twin prophets of the Baha'i faith, the Bab and Baha'u'llah. Now let's talk about afterlife and Baha'i beliefs and teachings about heaven and hell. By the way, on the left you see the Baha'i uh, symbol, nine-pointed star. Uh, some of my students called it the superstar of David. I think this is a great name. So, um, Baha'u'llah uh, teaches that apocalyptic terms that we discover in various books in the Bible, for example, in the book of Revelation, such as heaven and earth, the sun, the moon, the stars, resurrection of the dead, return of the prophets, etc., that all those terms should be interpreted symbolically, not literally. Because when you encounter a passage like that, when you read in the Bible, that uh, in the end of days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will stop giving light and the stars will fall from the sky and the people will get resurrected, will come from the graves, etc. Uh, that should not uh, have a literal meaning because it does not correspond to what we observe in reality. So all those uh, various uh, expressions are simply symbolic expressions and they refer to spiritual states. So uh, heaven and hell, for example, uh, are symbolic terms that signify spiritual states of being close to God. And what does this mean to be close to God? It means to be a good moral person. The more moral you are, the more virtuous you are, the more you are close to God, because God is the sum of all virtues. Uh, also, Baha'i teachings tell us that every individual has an immortal soul and continues his or her existence after the death of the physical body. However, as Baha'u'llah says, uh, we do not really know and we cannot know um, what kind of uh, spiritual existence that will be because the spiritual world is radically different from our material existence. And therefore, the only thing that we can do is to use certain um, terms that are associated with our material existence in order to um, refer those words to the spiritual existence we do not really understand. Here are some other teachings about the afterlife that um, belong to Abdul Baha, the leader of the movement after Baha'u'llah. After the death of the body, the human soul remains in the degree of purity to which it has evolved during its earthly life. In other words, when you die, you do not find yourself changed in terms of your inner world. Your inner world uh, remains with you and you start progressing spiritually um, after that. 
Uh, second, unlike material objects that can be transformed into one another, human soul has an innate individuality and could never evolve into something other than itself. So in other words, um, your self-identity uh, is unique and your self-identity will continue in the spiritual world uh, and you will not, will not be able to change yourself into anyone else. And finally, in the afterlife, human souls will acquire spiritual means of perception and will be able to recognize and communicate with their friends and loved ones. Now, after those general remarks uh, about the afterlife in Baha'i teachings, I would like to uh, finish this lecture and this course uh, back where we started. And we did start with Buddhism and the discussion of the concept of reincarnation. And then we moved on to Greek and Hellenistic philosophy to Plato and Cicero, and we discussed their arguments for the immortality of the soul. In Baha'i faith, uh, the teachings about afterlife are not only uh, spiritual and scriptural, uh, but also rational and take the form of the arguments. Those arguments come mainly from Abdul Baha. You see his portrait on the left slide when he was already an old man traveling to different parts uh, of Europe and America in order to promulgate the teaching of his father. In many of his talks, Abdul Baha delivers various rational arguments against reincarnation and for the immortality of the soul. Uh, what I will do is um, I will uh, simply read those arguments one by one uh, because I arranged those arguments uh, in a logical form and gave each argument its own uh, title. Uh, some of those arguments may remind you of what we discussed uh, in Plato and Cicero, but many of the arguments Abdu'l-Baha is offering are unique and really creative. Plus, we have to remember that the Baha'i faith, like uh, all other monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, rejects the idea of reincarnation. So therefore, Abdu'l-Baha uh, gives us a series of arguments against the notion of re reincarnation and also provides a series of arguments for the immortality of the soul. So let me start with the first argument, and we are talking about arguments against reincarnation, argument from parallel worlds. The outward is the expression of the inward. The earthly realm is the mirror of the heavenly kingdom, and the material world is in accordance with the spiritual world. In the sensible world, the divine appearances are not repeated, for no created thing can be identical with another in every way. Hence, Abdu'l-Baha concludes, reincarnation, which is the repeated manifestation in this world of the same spirit with its former essence and conditions, is thus impossible. The second argument uh, against reincarnation, the argument from imperfection. Number one, change of nature is impossible through renewal and return since matter always remains in the state of imperfection. Number two, it is thus clear that recurrence and return to the material world are not the means of attaining perfection as reincarnationists claim. Next argument uh, from incorporeality of the spirit. Number one, believers in reincarnation conceive of the body as a vessel and the spirit as its contents, like water and cup, with the water being emptied from one cup and poured into another. However, the spirit is an entirely incorporeal being. It does not enter or exit 
but is connected with the body as the sun is with the mirror. Hence, reincarnation is impossible. Argument from divine power. The major argument of the reincarnationists was that according to the justice of God, each must receive his due either in the present or future life. But this would make spiritual progress depend on human them, humans themselves and not on God's supreme and special influence. If creation went forward according to only one rule, how could the all-encompassing power make itself felt? Hence, reincarnationists are wrong. Uh, next one, from natural law. Number one, advancing and moving through the world's in a direct line and according to the natural law is the cause of existence. And the movement against the natural order and arrangement of things is the cause of extinction. The return of the spirit after death is incompatible with the natural movement and contrary to the divine order and therefore reincarnation is impossible. Here is another one from unhappiness. According to the views of reincarnationists, we come back to earthly life in order to reap out our rewards and punishments. However, on this dusty earth, all humankind are suffering. Here no man is at rest as a reward for what he has performed in former lives, nor is there anyone so blissful as seemingly to pluck the fruit of bygone anguish. Therefore, reincarnationists must be wrong. And the last three arguments against reincarnation. The argument from unlimited creation. Number one. Some reincarnationists believe that God's creation is limited to our material universe. If this were so, what would be the harvest of creation? Were such a notion true, then all created things, all contingent realities, and this whole world of being, all would be meaningless. But since creation is unlimited, human afterlife consists not in earthly reincarnations, but in spiritual progress and immortality. Here is another one from scriptural interpretation. Number one. The notion of a return is indeed referred to in the Holy Scriptures. Believers in reincarnation interpreted those allusions in terms of their own theories. In reality, those passages meant the return of the qualities, conditions, effects, perfections, and inner realities of the light, which recur in every dispensation. The reference is not to specific individual souls and identities. And finally, the argument from undesirability. The material world is imperfect. Who then would like to be incarnated again in such an imperfect world? And now, a series of arguments for the immortality of the soul or spirit. The first argument from spirit not being part of the physical body. The first premise is that material existence is subject to composition and decomposition, which is certainly true. The second premise is that human spirit is not a material entity because its power persists while the person is asleep and the body is resting, because changes in the body, including amputations of bodily organs, do not affect the spirit, because it is not available to our senses, because the body itself does not produce thought, which is the characteristic feature of human mind or spirit, and because man is not a captive of nature and can't discover its secrets. So therefore, Abdu'l-Baha concludes, human spirit is not subject to decomposition and is immortal. Here is another argument that I personally find to be very strong. Argument from nature. Number one, human intelligence is nowhere to be found in the natural world, except uh, in us humans. What is present in parts should also exist in the whole, but it doesn't. 
Hence, human intelligence or spirit is not part of nature. But anything in nature is subject to composition and decomposition. And human spirit is not a natural or material entity. Therefore, human spirit is not subject to decomposition, which means that it is immortal. Here is another argument from unchanging spirit. The spirit within oneself never changes and therefore is single and not composed of elements. Non-composed entities are not subject to decomposition. Therefore, the human spirit is indestructible and hence immortal. Arguments from forms. Number one, material entities cannot possess two forms simultaneously. However, the spirit of man could conceive all geometrical forms simultaneously. Therefore, spiritual reality is different from the limitations of matter and hence immortal. Arguments from effects. Number one, non-existing entities do not leave traces or effects of their activity. But human life produces a lasting impact on the world of nature and society. And therefore, human spirit should be more than just a combination of material elements. Arguments from sacrifice uh, that I may remind you of Cicero and his proofs. People would not sacrifice their lives if their spirits were not immortal. Prophets of God suffered to death for the benefit of humanity. Therefore, human spirit is immortal. Argument from conservation of energy. Number one, there is no total annihilation in the world of creation. The first law of thermodynamics. Number two, but man is part of creation. Therefore, human beings are immortal. Argument from gradation of things. Gradation of things presupposes the existence of the superlative degree. The world of matter is the world of mortality. Therefore, immortality as the superlative degree of mortality must exist as well. And finally, the argument from the inner sight. Inner sight is greater than sensory perception. By inner sight, Abdul Baha means intuition. Um, inner sight is greater than sensory perception, which uses the instrumentality of the body. Should the mind be the extension of the body, its power should also be in the same proportion, but it is not. Therefore, human mind or spirit is different from the body and therefore is immortal. So on this positive note, I would like to conclude this lecture and I'll see you someday either in this world or in the world to come.